I've just been uh, <coughs> giving this heater a bit of a once over because uh, winter's coming fast isn't it so uh, I've been getting a few questions about this in the past so I'll just quickly go through it I've seen now look see that, I'm not going to touch it because it's it's not long been going so it's a bit hot in there but that is uh, that's loose it sits on top of a hole and the hole is I don't know three inches round like that there's an old uh, gas bottle top uh, gas bottle welded in there look with a load of holes uh, drilled in the side underneath here there's a, a four inch hole cut in the bottom and then we've just got a disc uh, welded in all the way well not welded in it's just sat in there actually so what we're trying to do is when we light it we want it to suck the air from the bottom through these holes so as it's burning it uh, gives it decent combustion the door as you can see it's just cut round I've got fire right round there uh, siliconed on with uh, high temperature silicon there is a little bit of glass in there look, but it's a bit dark at the minute I've got a gate valve on there and like a sight glass there so I can see how much oil's going in come back a bit, it's made out of an old, old uh, propane bottle the door on the top there that's just me so I can have a look inside and make it a bit easier to clean it out you don't really need that to be fair so uh, if I was to do this again would I make any changes well straight away I wouldn't have it that high off the floor I would uh, cut the legs right down I'd really want it you know only maybe five inches off the floor the bottom of the tank the reason for that being is when you do these the most critical part of this whole thing is the flue now that's uh, I think it's a four inch flue I've got a tape measure here quickly have a quick look so now it's a five inch flue yeah so it's a five inch flue it's about a four or five inch hole underneath there I wonder if I can get that out yeah so there you go look it's just straight through the bottom and that's just welded up so you can I'm doing this all hand out so I don't want it to come out like that just sits on there how do I light it this uh, old fairy liquid tub I suppose I put maybe a fifth petrol to four fifths oil something around there give it a bit of a shape I squirt it in the bottom of there and uh, I just light a bit of tissue paper and throw it in when it starts to get when it's been burning for two or three minutes like that with the door not completely shut but nearly shut I wait till it's got a bit of warmth in there and then I'll close the door and you can hear the difference as soon as you do because you hear it start to roar then I go there and I turn on my oil now this does work really really well it burns clean hello shop dog alright mate it's tea time so there's my shed so there's my flue going up there I should say that that flue is one two it's about three and a half meters tall but I'll be honest with you it's not tall enough and around the side here look on the outside that's a 25 litre bucket with a lid on obviously from uh, flea bay and if you can just see underneath there look I've drilled a slight hole in it so it uh, lets the air in as the oil's running down just come straight out the bottom another gate valve there the pipe goes down there through the side of the shed. Now, you got two feet. Now, when you do these, if you ever want to do it, I'll be straight. I'll be straight up with you. If you can't get your flu three and a half to four meters in the air, then forget about it. Because, like anything to do with combustion, these things will smoke when you've got more fuel than the oxygen that's than the supply of oxygen and that's the same for anything whether it's a boiler a gas cooker your car you know they, they smoke because there's more fuel being there's not enough oxygen for the amount of fuel being burned it's as simple as that so the idea behind the height of the flue is as the flue gets hotter it causes more draw therefore it drags more air in from the bottom of that uh, 
it drags more air in through the bottom. And it's telling me to change the battery pack. Drags more air in through the bottom of that hole. Sorry, the bottom of that hole. The hole in the bottom of the cylinder pulls more air through. Therefore, more oxygen to the amount of fuel that you're burning, you get a clean burn. The critical thing for this is it's the length of that flue. That's what you really need. Coupled with the fact that you draw the air in through the bottom, the way this is set up. Uh, a guy from Ireland called, his channel's called camera died on my battery went. Right, as I was saying, for more technical sort of information on, on uh, how to go about making one of these, like I say, the lad in Ireland, uh, his channel's called Jerry's DIY. I think he's a plumber like me actually. <coughs> uh, he's really gone to town on these and done a fantastic job with them. But what I will say to you is, you know, if you're going to make one of these and use, use something like this, you want to be extremely careful. It's not the sort of thing that you want to be going in the house at uh, whatever time for your dinner or for your tea and then just thinking, well, I'll just turn it down a bit and leave it going because you never know what might happen. Uh, it's, they do work extremely well. It's quick to light. It heats this shop up. This shop must be, what, three and a half metres. Well, there's got to be 30 square metres of floor space in here and that heats this up, you know, easily. So, uh, but you know, just bear in mind, just be careful with them. Right, back to the job and end. We'll get that arbor out of the chuck and then uh, see the discs on the top of there. We'll get one of them set up, get it running true, and machine the middle out. Right. right, I think we've got somewhere. No cigar here. Mm. Oh, that's nip there. Get in there, monkey. Oh, I'll just put a bit of a nip on that. In the bloody way. Put a uh, little bearing on a stick in. Get some power on that. And uh, see what that does, shall we? I can see it's a long way out. Pushed it fairly true. I suppose what we should do is put the test indicator on it, shouldn't we? And just see how far out we are. Can you see that? I'll block the light out. Right, let's see what we can do then, shall we? 
So that's high. So what we got? Have you seen it? Bring you in a bit, and then. So we're about four thou out, aren't we? Five nearly. A bit high there. Let's bring that in just a touch more. Preload it a bit. I think if I'd have pushed a bit harder with the bearing, I'd have got it closer, but because it's on them copper shims, it's a bit hard, a bit difficult. So there. Well, we're less than half a thou, we're just a few tenths really. It's not the best test indicator in it, it's gone up a bit more. Let me just put a bit more. <coughs> See, I can tighten that up quite a lot. Well, oh. didn't move, did it? It's half a sail eye there, back to zero. I think I'm going to call that good because if you look, each revolution it's moving, so it's saying it's half a thou out there. I'll bring that one all the way around again. Hmm, maybe. Oh, now I've done it. <laughs> I'm going to get, uh, get the other one because I'm not sure that that one is giving us the right <coughs> reading if I'm honest. I'll try my trusty little mitt of toy at least with this one we can put a full. That's a thou. Touch the indicator with me on there. So that's low. That's about a thou in it. Not the easiest thing to get in and tap, to be fair. Plus one. Oh, that's pretty much staying at plus one. I think we'll call it at that. I don't know sometimes when I'm being a bit too finicky with this, but I suppose if we think that it's going to be doing three and a half, 
what is it, 3,800 rips a minute, then I suppose we ought to get it as close as we can. I suppose it's a way of balancing it, isn't it? Uh, what have you done with spanner, you dopey git? Oh, come on, where have I put that? I had it a minute ago and then I moved it out of the way. <laughs> Right, so all we're going to do here, we're going to take small cuts because we've not got masses holding it on. We're just going to blend that in with this. Oh, I've just got to, uh, a slight blemish on the end of my cutter look. I'll just clean that up and then uh, we'll have another go. Uh, <coughs> quick lick with the diamond file and then uh, it should be alright we'll just I'll tell you what we'll do we'll touch off on that face because when I'm down to zero I'm just going to take just a couple of thou off it just to try to blend it all in together so touch off there all right, we'll go for it, shall we? Doesn't matter any run out that's going up and down. We're not worried about that because we know that runs concentric with the threaded part. We just want to flash this front off and get this uh, a nice light cut. Let me move that camera. So, yeah, so I'm happy with that. So I'll do the other one. I won't film doing the other one. Uh, then we'll put them on a milling machine. Uh, we've got a couple of holes to drill in, obviously, for the pin spanner. And then that'll be those two discs done. When we've got them done, the next thing we've got to do is... This is obviously one of the hubs. So it's got balancing weights in the back of it. So the way this works, the disc that we've made screws on the front as you as you're all most probably well aware by now. Holds the grinding wheel on there. And then that's the hub and the wheel. They stay together all the time. You take this off separately, put it on, tighten this nut up in the front. Uh, it, it's tapered in there. So you push that on the taper, tighten that nut up. We've made an, I've made another one of these nuts. It's got to have some slots cut in it. And then I've got to make a tool with a couple of fingers on that uh, I can put this nut on and off without thrashing it to an inch of its life with a bloody punch or whatever they've been using in the past. So when the nut comes off, that'll still be on the grinder and you'll see in the end what will be stuck in there is the spindle shaft obviously and it's got a countersunk hole in the end or, or a centre hole. So what we've got to make then is something that will screw on the end of there uh, a piece of tube of some sort with another thread in, threaded bar inside it so we tighten the threaded bar up on the end of the spindle shaft and as you tighten it up breaks the taper, pops that off so that's uh, that's what we'll do when we get these discs done finished so 
I'll do the other one and then uh, we'll be on the mill. So this is where we've got to. We've got both the discs done. We're just going to sling them on the milling machine in a minute, drill some holes in them. I thought I'd just show you this. I've been wanting one for quite a while and I managed to get one. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it wasn't quite the size I thought it might be when it came. Uh, I must have misread that's two and a half inches. But it weighs a ton uh, and it came today. Uh, I can barely pick it up. I know you might think I'm, you know, I know you might think I'm taking the piss, but <laughs> it's not that one. It's that one. It uh, what you call a dividing head. It's uh, just let me move that. She's a big one. That's just over. Well, it's 12 inches round, you can sit it on its back or as it is now or on that side. It's got uh, quick divisions cut into the side here. There are no marks in the table whatsoever. Uh, 4 degrees per turn, 90 to 1 ratio. You can pull the handle, oh, you can't quite see that can you? I'll tell you what boys, it's heavy. You can uh, disengage the handle so it will run free and then here we've got a uh, quick indexer, obviously two locks on it. I'm not sure what the make is, uh, I did find one the same as this a while ago and uh, a guy had advertised it and he said it was uh, seized up, been sat in his garage for 10 years, blah de blah, but he said he was reliably informed. Soaking it in some diesel would uh, would sort it out. This one, however, I'll take that off there. It's not seized. It's all right. What it does need, however, is stripping down and cleaning out because there is one tight spot on it when you turn it. But there's no marks on it or anything. Uh, I found it on flea bay. The guy got it up at a, as a buy it now price, I think, uh, and I realised he got it up as, you know, pretty cheap. There was one of these the other day, identical to that, and I wouldn't have said it was in any better condition. 670 quid, I think it was. Anyway, I'm not going to say what this guy got this one up for, but I sent him an offer, which was about 30 quid lower, I think, than what he'd actually originally got it up for. And I wasn't trying to be cheeky as such, it, it was all I could afford, so that's what I offered him. Uh, he sent me a counter off the back, which somewhere met in the middle, and I replied back to him, and I was honest, and I just said that, in my opinion, it was worth a substantial amount more than what I was offering him, and if he was to hang on for it, then I'm sure he would get around that kind of figure. However, my problem was that was all I could afford. Uh, it was going to cost me another 50 quid to get it collected because it was the other side of Manchester, which is quite a bit of a trek from here. And he wrote back to me and he said, no, I'll take that, mate, that's fine. Uh, I just asked him quickly if everything worked on it and it was all right. And he said, yeah, it could really just do with a, a good clean, which, you know, he's been honest. And uh, anyway. That's what we've got. I've wanted one for a long, long time. Makes that one look a bit silly, doesn't it? <laughs> I bought that because it's quite, I thought it might be handy. It was cheap and it would actually, uh, it'll go with my vice on the milling machine for doing anything really small. I've got no T-nuts for it and I've got no T-nuts for that. So I've got to make some and some clamps for it and what have you. But before I do any of that, uh, I'm going to strip it down and give it a wash in some degreaser wash the bearings and everything out and uh, re-grease it up. I've spoken to Robin because I'm not sure what type of grease that's put in and he's, he said it really wants some light lithium type grease in it so we'll get some of that sorted. I should just go over the numerals here you know with uh, some fine wire wool just to bring them out of it. I'm not going to paint it 
because I I think with old machinery if you uh, if you just paint it I don't think it ever looks good unless you're going to go the whole hog I mean all the decal bits and everything but for me I think just uh, cleaned out stoned the table off I mean I actually I, I went over the table with a little bit of degreaser just to have a good look at it and I run a, st a flat stone over it which I've, I've ground on my surface grinder and I didn't find any burrs on it whatsoever so that's it uh, I do believe on one of the listings I saw that a guy reckoned it weighed 52 kilos well I'm not a strong man but I'm not very I'm not exactly weak either and I picked that up I did pick it up off the ground off of a pallet and I carried it about 25 30 yards to my van and trust me that was enough it wouldn't surprise me if this thing weighed around the 78 kilo mark but uh, whatever it is it's bloody heavy it's well made I would like to know if anybody knows any information on these or where it was made who made it I presume it's an English one uh, I'll have to make a frame and stand it to one side of the milling machine behind the table so uh, when, as and when I want to use it I can just wind the table down to the same height as the platform I put this on and slide it on you trust me I'm, like I say I'm not weak but you don't want to be picking this bloody thing on up and down it's a way the ton oh, the back of it is uh, well you'll see that it looks to me like it's been scraped in to be fair at some point oh, I can't spin it all the way around Yeah, that's scrape marks that is look. So the bottom's been scraped in. I should say when it was when it was manufactured. Uh, you can see the quick index marks here. That's your quick indexer. But uh, yeah, what a piece of kit. What a freaking weight. Anyway, that's a job for the future. We'll get back onto these and get some holes drilled. It's dropping in the gully in the glass. Help if you had the right chip key.
find the middle of that. So it's 3 <laughs> Fine in between the in between the jaws, that should be enough. Smack in the middle. Right. There's one slight issue I have with these is that when that is on the, on the hook, the original holes, I wouldn't be able to get this particular pin spanner in. Well, I can just, but it's catching the threads if you can see that. So, I think what we're going to have to do is make them a little bit wider. So we'll do this real scientifically. They're about 45mm apart, or inch and three quarter. So I think if I was to make them two inches apart, yeah, then that would be all right. Wouldn't it? Two inches apart, where's my very near as good. What have you done with that? So the pins measure one forty three, one four one. So we want to drill at least 143. I'll see what I can find. 